This morning's scripture reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 10. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except for my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it so that no one may think better of me than what it's what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of evil to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. Amen. How does the Trinity speak to power? Well, I'd love to talk on that. If God is not almighty, but all vulnerable, that God's self-limiting and self-emptying, the Father empties himself 100% into the Son. The Son empties himself 100% into the giving of the Spirit. The Spirit 100% empties himself into the Father. And this flow of perfect love never stops. Then here's what I'm going to jump to the conclusion. The nature of God has redefined the nature of power. And power is in fact powerlessness. Follow the logic of that? <laughs> that, that God in becoming powerless defines power in a new way and it is now the power of love. You've got to be weak but, to be strong. Yeah, there you go. So Paul gets it. When I am weak, I am strong. There's the best one-liner. But Philippians 2, he emptied himself. But we've got to make sure this is clear in the book. This redefinition of power. Because if we don't make that clear, a lot of people will go on with a pious understanding of Trinity and not let it teach them a new politics, a nonviolent theory of human nature. That self-emptying, and we taught it in our initiation rites. The, the assumption that allowed me to create the male initiation rites was uh, summed up in this one line. Discovered in disparate cultures from Australia to Africa to Celtic Europe, that any male who is not led on journeys of powerlessness will always abuse power. That's the assumption of why the world needed initiation rites. I mean, how do you get anything done if everybody's emptying themselves? Well, only if they rediscover the new power. But now the new power is not connected to their ego. Can you see the difference? You're, you're absolutely right. That's why we call this place action and contemplation. We want people to use their power, but we need a new kind of power. <laughs> we need a power, the kind you see in Nelson Mandela the kind we saw in Abraham Lincoln, you know? So it exists, the kind we saw in Gandhi and Jesus, yeah? They were powerful men. And how how is the Trinity, how does that speak to that power? How is that a model for that power? How is that a model for for reality? It will forever be disdained by people who only understand dominative power. And I do think that's why Jesus said, I'm sounding you out like sheep among wolves. Why we in the Christian tradition, I thought of it at Mass yesterday when I intoned the Lamb of God, which is one of the parts of the Mass, and I just preached on it. So I said, you notice what you're going to say now? You're not saying Lion of God. Why not? 
Why are you saying Lamb of God? You've been saying this all your life, Lamb of God, with, you know, just rolls off your tongue. But this is revolutionary notion of God, Lamb of God instead of Lion of God. So it will, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. He knows that the politicians, the power-seeking people of this world will disdain and destroy this until the end of time. They will have no respect for it. And yet Jesus goes to his executioners knowing that. And can you now read the whole Passion account on a whole new level? <laughs> that he knew the price of this, the bloodletting that would come from it, was going to be part of the deal. So I, I think that's why we don't want an all-vulnerable God. We want an almighty God. I wish I could rewrite the prayers of the church. I really do. And see that 60% of them are asking that we can go to heaven, directly or indirectly. The official prayers of, of the church, you know. And 50% of them begin with almighty God. We should just say Lion of God if we really want... Almighty God, <laughs> nice donkey. <laughs> yeah. we, uh, we don't get the Christian revelation. And again, so I don't make this all bad will or intentional resistance. I just think the revelation of God is so monumental and massive and counterintuitive that I'm quite sure here we are sitting in 2016 that history will eventually call this early Christianity. That we are living in early Christianity. We just began to scratch the surface of what Trinity is saying about who God is, what creation is, and who we are, and how we are included in the deal, which is for us, of course, the good news. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, God, our rock and redeemer. Amen. So I have to say, when I first saw this video, my first thought was, easy for you to say, Richard Rohr. You are an old, white, American male you are, carry the authority of the Catholic priesthood. You are one of the most famous spiritual writers in the world. So it's easy for you to talk about giving up power because you have power to spare. I wonder, how would this message sound if we took it today down to safe place? down to the women there fleeing domestic violence and advise them to perpetually empty themselves in love, to embrace their powerlessness. I wonder how that message would sound to them. But then again, I wonder how the message would sound in circles like Alcoholics Anonymous or Al-Anon or Overeaters Anonymous because the first step of the 12 steps is embracing our powerlessness. The first step of 
Alcoholics Anonymous is we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, or for Al-Anon, the alcoholic, for Overeaters Anonymous food, that our lives had become unmanageable. So this 12 steppers have got it figured out that the healing can only happen once we acknowledge our powerlessness. They have understood the power of powerlessness. So I wonder, which camp are you in? Do you like this idea of embracing powerlessness or not? I got to tell you, I do not like the idea of being powerless. I want to be in control. I want to believe that if I say all the right things and if I do all the right things, if I pray hard enough, if I work hard enough, I can get other people to live up to my expectations. I can get my kids to follow my directions. I can white knuckle it through temptation and I can get my life to turn out just according to plan. But the reality is that I still have not figured out how to control other people's behavior. I still, a lot of times, can't even control myself. And my life just keeps turning out in unexpected ways. And so I realize that I am not the one in the driver's seat. And some days, this is comforting. I say, Jesus, take the wheel. And other days, I have to admit, I'm pretty ticked off about it. And lately, I've been in the ticked off camp. And I have to admit, I was sitting in the pew this week thinking about that. And I was thinking about this letter that Paul writes And he says, power is made perfect in weakness. And when I am weak, I am strong. I was thinking about that and sitting right there. And so, of course, this phrase right here, fight for the powerless, stuck out to me. And somehow that ticked me off even more. (laughs) Because I thought, who are these powerless ones? Who, who are they? Because in Genesis, we are all created in the image and likeness of God. So we are each given the image of God. Isn't that an incredible declaration of innate power? And then just a verse or two later, God gives us dominion over all the earth. Dominion, which Jesus teaches us, isn't power over, but power with. Power to break the chains of oppression and break the yoke of injustice. So from the beginning of Genesis, the beginning of Scripture, we are told that we are given both power and dominion. So who are these powerless? Maybe there are people in society that we have disempowered. But we all have some kind of power. So I got got me thinking, maybe we should just print a new sign and maybe we should say, fight for the disempowered. But then I thought, no, no, that doesn't work either. And yes, I do overthink everything. There is nobody with a master's in divinity that doesn't overthink things, okay? And I was thinking, no, that doesn't work either because it still separates us falsely into two categories, the powerful and the powerless, the haves and the haves-nots, and those who got it those, and those who don't have it. And clearly, if we have this fight for the powerless on our sign, that means we've allied ourselves with power. We're the ones that got it. And those people, those others out there, bless their hearts, they need our help. Talk about disempowering. Talk about patronizing. And friends, the truth is, there are disempowered people here today among us. There are abused people here. There are sick people here. There are hurting people here. There are broken people here today, here joining us online today. And thank God you are here today because that means that Jesus is among us this morning. 
So, okay, what do we do then? What do we do with this phrase, fight for the powerless? What do we change it to? Um, power with the disempowered to break the yoke of oppression. I don't think it fits. It's a little bit too long. But what's more important than the sign is these questions. One, what do we do with our God-given power? Two, what do we give with our, do with our societal given power, that is our privilege? And three, what do we do with our powerlessness? So, what I think, though, that we're bumping up against here and what Richard Rohr is trying to say is that when we say power, we often mean a lot of different things. In fact, in the Greek, in the original Greek, there happened to be four different words that all translate to the English word for power. The first Greek word for power is kratos, which is literally a kind of power that is conquering and mighty. So I think kings and lords and all of that. The second Greek word for power is iskus. It's kind of similar, but think more like horsepower or muscles. It has to do more with action and, uh, and might. The third Greek word for power is dunamis. And this is where we get the word um, dynamic and dynamite. It's this innate power within God and within us. It's like power or potential. And finally, the fourth Greek word for power is exousia. And this is the power that Christ was said to have. It was said that Christ spoke with exousia. And exousia is the power of authenticity, of moral authority, the power of relationship, the power even of vulnerability and innocence. To put it in another way, if you had a bodybuilder and a celebrity and a precious toddler in a room, all three have a very different kind of power. So the bodybuilder has iscus. They have physical power. The celebrity has dunamis. They have this charisma power. But the toddler, the toddler, they have exousia. They have the power to melt that bodybuilder into a babbling mush. They have the power to captivate the eyes of the whole room. They have the power to put everyone on their best behavior. And that kind of power is exousia, the power of powerlessness, the power of an innocent child, the power of relationship and authenticity. And it is Christ's power and the greatest power of all. It is the greatest because it is rooted in love. And that makes sense. That makes sense because of what we've been talking about the last three weeks when we talk about Trinity. When we talk about Trinity, we talk about that God's essence, the Trinity, God and God's very self, is a loving relationship among three. So Christ's power wouldn't be aligned with principalities or empire or white privilege or any of those things. Christ's power would be aligned in relationship, exousia, and you can spend your whole life chasing power. You can spend your whole life chasing kratos or iskus, and many people do. You could die a Russian oligarch with all kinds of treasures in your basement, but exousia will eventually win because we all succumb to powerlessness in the end, weakness diminishment as we age 
we all become, again, like little children. That's why Christ said, to enter the kingdom of God, we must become like little children. The first shall become last. So yes, both are true. We are innately powerful. We have power and dominion. And yet, our greatest power lies in a kind of powerlessness. It lies in an openness to vulnerability and relationship, a letting go to love, and a complete surrender to the triune God. And this is the strongest power in the world, not because of might. It is the power of the triune God rooted in love. Amen.